Hello and welcome once again to the Ubuntu podcast. It's season 14, episode 15, and it's Tuesday the 15th of June. In this episode, we're going to be covering the goings on in the community, some news headlines and some events. And joining me as ever are Martin. Hello, hello. And Alan. Hello. And we also have a special guest this week joining us fresh from the Ubuntu Voltage live stream. It's Stuart Langridge. Hello. Thanks for joining us again, Stuart. I do what I can. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, Martin, what have you been up to recently? I've been learning DaVinci Resolve. And what is DaVinci Resolve? Uh, DaVinci Resolve is a video editing, compositing, audio editing suite that competes with Adobe Premiere Pro and Final Cut Pro. You mean it competes with Caden Live? <laughs> no, it does not. <laughs> I have a complaint here. I have to say, I appreciate that um, most of the people listening to this show will have listened to your previous show a week ago or whatever, but I only actually managed to catch up on it today. So less than two hours ago, I was admonished by Martin Wimpress for using KDN Live rather than Shotcut. <laughs> and now you're like, no, don't use that at all. Use DaVinci. Yeah, I, I am aware He's moved on. Of, uh, of the timeliness of this announcement i i'm uh, i stand by the fact that shotcut is the best open source video editor on any platform but i've been editing some video recently and i've needed to do some more clever things at least i didn't think they were clever until i looked into it and anyway it turns out you need to do things like rotoscoping and object tracking and stuff like that all things that these professional tools can do actually quite trivially i imagine you can do it in blender if you're you know a blender god but i am not that hang on hang on um you can do you can do rotoscoping in kdn live for a start because i've done okay good for you (laughs) (laughs) i I mean don't get me wrong i'm not for a moment suggesting that it's not going to be as convenient as a proper tool but All the stuff you're describing you can do, and I'm surprised you can't do them in Shotcut if it is genuinely the premier way of accessing the MLT framework. (laughs) Well, I think it is, As I was told. Well, I maybe it's... I couldn't find the options I wanted, but part of this was also I... You hear a lot about people say, oh, I can't possibly switch to Linux because I need the Adobe Creative Suite. And when you look at what DaVinci Resolve offers for free, because it's a freemium platform, so there's a free version you get a really good video editor, color grading, visual effects, 3D effects, compositing, and a broadcast quality audio editor. It's a pretty amazing bit of kit. And I've had a lot of time learning it. And it's not that hard to learn either, I was surprised to see. It's unmistakably a pro-level tool. So if you're getting into video editing in a, uh, and so you want to do a bunch of, that's really cool. But it's if you just want to chuck together a video for your family to look at, it's really hard. It's like Lightworks, same thing. <laughs> Alan, what have you been up to? I've been playing with DHT11 temperature sensors. They sound like fun. Yes, they look like this. I'm holding it up, which is no good for an audio show, but so you, the, you can see if you just do a Google search for DHT11, they're little things that you can attach to like Arduinos or Raspberry Pis or stuff and then sense the temperature in the room and the humidity and i bought a pack of them off of our favorite um jeff bezos pension scheme amazon and (laughs) uh hooked them up to a bunch of raspberry Pis around my house and then uh ran telegraph which is my day job on all of them and they all send uh data to this cloud dashboard where i can graph and see a history of the temperature in the various rooms around the house and because i've got four of them i put one in different rooms one's in the loft one's in my office one's outside my office so i can see the differential between inside and outside my office and one's downstairs and they're all sending data and did you learn anything interesting about how hot your various rooms are I certainly learned that the loft is significantly hotter than every other room in the house. And then the next hottest is this room that I'm currently sat in, which has lots of computers in it. And the loft has lots of computers in it. So, you know, who would have known? Um, But I want to try and, um, uh, you know, figure out if there's some way of improving the heating in this house so that it's, you know, more balanced and it's not just hot in some places and cold in other places, but try Mm. and balance things. And I thought monitoring was a good way to start that. Mm. Yeah, data. You would think entropy would do that for you, but... (laughs) (laughs) And with that, let's get on with the show. And 
now it's time for some community news and events. And first up in the community news, Alan. TechCrunch are reporting that Jingling have gained 10 million in recent financing round. And for those not aware, Jingling is a company that are making a Linux tablet. Um, yes, it's a startup. They've currently, they've had a, a crowdfunder, uh, recently where they didn't ask for a lot of money. They only asked for like 12 grand, 14 grand UK, and they got 46 grand. Which isn't actually a tremendous amount when you think about, yeah, it's a hardware device, a tablet. Often these tablets get a lot more funding, but maybe people are a bit shy about these things now or they didn't promote it very well. I don't know. But yeah, they've had an injection of cash and there's been a few articles about their operating system. It's called Jingo S or Jing OS. <laughs> Jingo doesn't sound good to my British brain, but there you go. Um, but yeah, they've got a pile of money. So maybe this thing will actually get manufactured and available for people to buy rather than just a small select group of uh, mm. crowdfunders. Yeah. TechCrunch seemed to think that their pitch is going to be going after Chromebooks. Mm. It does look more friendly. Um, I mean, obviously, it looks like a tablet OS because it's got big fat buttons and it looks very iPad-y and android but it's not. It's their own, you know, homegrown, built on Linux thing. Um whether it can compete with with Chrome OS, I mean, it's got the 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 look and feel of a tablet and a keyboard, um, so it's got that flexibility. But um, we'll have to wait and see. I think. What sort of Linux distribution is it? I mean, what sort of question is that? Well, <laughs> is it is it derived from something we'd recognise, or is it like a homegrown, bespoke? You know, I haven't tried it. I'm not sure. Okay, I don't. I don't know. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's all built from their own stuff. I haven't looked at the package manager or anything. They picked up um, a bunch of people who used to work on Aliun OS, which is um, which was Alibaba's Linux distribution. So I mm. suspect it might be fairly disjoint from the sorts of things that we're running on our desktops anyway. Yeah. Interesting. Martin, what did you find? I noticed that Torrent Freak is reporting that Web Sheriff has been submitting yet more erroneous links to Ubuntu and Fedora content as being pirated material. Yes, this was this was interesting because it seems like they're just picking URLs with tenuous links to um, copyrighted content. But the, if you actually look at the URLs, they're quite obviously IRC logs and uh, and Fedora mailing list archives. They're not downloads of movies or anything of the sort. And they just happen to have the right pattern of letters and numbers that would match a film from a mainstream studio or something. Yeah. So on the one hand, yeah, I grant you, yeah, just getting a Perl script to go and search the internet and send takedowns <laughs> is a bit iffy. But after the fix Ubuntu thing, this is probably not the hill to die on if you're if you're an Ubuntu person, right? I mean that was different, but it's still a very it's a similar kind of thing in people's heads, I suspect. Well, th this is part of the problem: is the fix Ubuntu thing was actually someone at Canonical in the legal team sending a yeah, please can we have an agreement for the way you use the Ubuntu trademark to the person who ran. Fix Ubuntu, which was unfortunate given his status as a, you know, um, legally bright person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you're right. Every time one of these comes up, I think there is a niggling doubt in the back of some people's minds. Eh, canonical, uh, trying to stop people talking about Ubuntu. I do feel like some people think that. Yeah. It totally isn't what's happening. No, absolutely not. It's just, yeah. <laughs> there, there are other things to complain about harder than this. Stuart, what's up next? I am told, and this is something I know nothing about, so those of you with um, children younger than mine, I'm interested in your opinion here, but Roblox is apparently, is it Roblox or Roblox? I'm told it's Roblox. Mm -hmm. Okay, Roblox is this hugely popular thing with the youth. <laughs> and um, <laughs> um, I feel like, you know, um, whatever his name is, Steve Buscemi doing the hi there fellow kids thing. But Roblox is a, a very popular, but it didn't work on Linux and they've just introduced a bunch of patches into Wine to make it work. Yes. So this could be a really big deal. This is one of those things that I would tend to dismiss until I find out that how, just how many people are interested in this. Hmm. It's weird. It's one of those, those games where it was almost as popular as Minecraft and it's got to the point where 
you can go into a toy shop and alongside the Minecraft figures and the Terraria figures, there are Roblox figures you can buy, real actual physical, you know, merchandise uh, affiliated with the game. So it is stupidly popular among the youth um, because it has a very good creative element. You can build things, you can build your own games inside Roblox and then invite your friends to join in the games, much like people create mods for minecraft but it's creating a game in roblox is way easier than creating a mod for minecraft so it's very accessible to creative types who are quite young so yeah it's quite appealing um and I'm, I'm sure some parents who prefer to use linux would welcome the fact that roblox can now run on it because then their children can use linux What's interesting about this, I didn't know what Roblox was until a couple of years ago when they presented at Ubuntu Masters and their presentation was how they lifted and shifted their entire backend infrastructure <laughs> from Windows to Ubuntu in like three months and used, wow. you know, all of the tooling that Canonical provides to do all of that cloud orchestration. Mm. The other thing is worth very briefly chucking in here is that um, a shout out to... Uh, all my fellow developers out there, this thing which was stopping the the biggest you know property on uh, in software from running on our platform was a one line patch in wine. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, next up, an update on two stories we've discussed in the past. A couple of episodes ago, we mentioned that FOSS host, a uh, organization who provide free hosting for open source projects, were looking for donations. Um, because they were quickly running out of money. Um, and it turns out they have been saved by everyone's favourite crown prince, Andrew Lee, uh, who you might know <laughs> as the person who uh, is behind the recent Free Node shenanigans. So um, Andrew Lee made a sizable donation to Foss Host and alongside that but apparently not as a condition of it started talks with them to partner with freenode um however since then uh, members of the FOSS host community have got in touch with them and they have decided not to pursue a partnership with freenode uh in the future although they did still take the money and there are still people on the freenode board from FOSS host which is a bit weird and i don't know if, how, yeah. if they're going to roll that back as well no we don't want to partner with you but thanks for the money <laughs> Was it actual money? It was a mixture of actual money and crypto nonsense. Oh, he's got a lot of that crypto nonsense. Handshake. I think we mentioned the handshake yes. crypto nonsense in the past, which is another Andrew Lee thing to do with some sort of distributed DNS root thing backed by crypto something, blockchain, blah, 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 um, which at the time a lot of that stuff was then donated to FOSS projects. I don't know if any of that money was then realised. Um, but yes, part of that formed the donation. But they have actually said they have enough actual money to keep going now, which is a good thing, I suppose. Um, Alan, more free node news. Oh, gosh. So <laughs> this morning I got a notification on my uh, single uh, connection to Freenode telling me that they're going to um, disconnect you and reconnect you to some new servers uh, so what Freenode have now done is pointed the DNS to a new bunch of servers that are running new software and new services like the authentication and channel management and bots and stuff running new services. But what they didn't do is migrate any of the users from the old servers to the new ones or any of the channels or authentication to the new servers. So what happens is if you're currently connected to Freenode as of like yesterday, the day recording this, and you get disconnected and you reconnect and you get one of the new servers, you're on a brand new free node network with no channels and no users registered in it. So you need to re-register yourself and re-register any channels, assuming nobody's been in that channel and got there before you. It's lovely that you got a notification telling you that this was about to happen because what I got was my account was banned. And when I tried reconnecting to the free node network unaware that this was happening because I didn't get the notification. I just got an account ban. As my client connected, it just gave me a message saying IRC cloud is not welcome here. And my connection was dropped. Yep. And so that was my experience. It's really going down the pan. IRC cloud completely blocked. 
Uh, some are speculating because Freenode now have their own bouncer and expect you to use their own bouncer rather than using uh, IRC Cloud. There are may- many other reasons why this may have occurred, but it's yet another <laughs> nail in the coffin for Freenode, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. I've even seen reports that not just channels who are, who are officially declaring that they've moved to Libra.chat, which seems to be where everyone's going, but channels where someone had discussed, mentioned the word Libra, mm. were be uh, the, um, people who own those channels reporting they're being forcibly taken over by uh, server admins and uh, and re and deopt and reopt and what have you. It's madness, madness. Wouldn't it have been easier? And quicker to just buy a Picasso and stick a knife in it or something. <laughs> Are you saying free mode <laughs> equates to a great art from Picasso? Okay. Well, I, I, to be clear, I, to be clear, I don't really like Picasso. I, you know, if I'd have said Tisha, that would have been something different. <laughs> How cultured. <laughs> Martin, what's been going on in the Linux game sphere? Uh, well, Mike Ibarra uh, has been teasing Linux gamers. I believe he's VP of Blizzard, mm. uh, and he uh, popped up with a poll on Twitter asking which people prefer to game on, Windows, Mac, or Linux. <laughs> I wonder what and happened. <laughs> I think maybe, possibly that got brigaded. <laughs> a little. <laughs> yeah. What were the results of the poll? 63% Windows. Three mm-hmm. percent uh, Mac OS sounds about right, mm-hmm. and glorious thirty four percent Linux. But of course, there we go. <laughs> Accurate statistics acquired. Yes, I think it must have done the rounds about around a bunch of maybe IRC channels and discords. It was posted to slash Linux. Ah, that'll do it. Apparently, I, I, th- I think I think it was all driven by Reddit. I mean, it can't be driven by IRC. No one's on IRC, right? They will be kicked off. Yes, but he then deleted the tweet because I think he realised. A Twitter poll is not the best way to gauge uh, how you measure uh, stats. And he was enlightened <laughs> and found the Steam survey. Um, I was going to say, I would have thought that a VP of Blizzard probably has a better source for this information than uh, than Twitter. Maybe. But, you know, sometimes you put a poll out just for a bit of fun. Like, you know, who won this contest? <laughs> 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 Yeah, I remember I remember a poll in 2018 from Foss Talk Live that I may have brigaded with the Ubuntu Mate community. Yes. <laughs> so yes, I don't, I don't I don't expect to see any Linux stuff from Blizzard anytime soon. Does make you slightly cross because if it had come up 95% Windows, 5% everyone else, which is honestly probably closer to the truth, they'd have gone to see we're justified in not doing Linux stuff. A whole bunch of Linux stuff comes in, they go, yeah, but it's all lies, which to be clear, it was. Um, so we're also, I can't think of what results that poll could have had which would have made them do anything different. So why do the poll, Mikey Barra? Stuart, what's up next? So Sommelier Core has got quite a bit of love. Now, this is something that I believe um, about half of this podcast were involved in creating, (laughs) at least partially. This is a thing for bundling Windows applications into Snaps. And the the other impression I have is that it kind of got built by um, uh, by Wimpy and Popey and... uh, Little Dan, a couple of others. Um, as far as I can tell, basically to make track mania nations forever work. <laughs> yep. And then it was sort of quietly left to sit in the back garden and, and you didn't no one did anything with it. And now people have gone, this seems very cool. Let's do a bunch of work to bring it up to date. Um, so there's now a wine platform, Snap, and it's using uh, GNOME 328, and it's picking up the modern themes from React OS 6 and so on. So this is just good right yeah yes it is good and and to be fair i think people have uh, um separated sommelier from trackmania nations forever some time ago and this has been a standalone thing for a little while and now it's getting a sort of a little bit of an uplift and an update but i love this because i did document it quite well when i made it and i think that's helped have a life of its own um and i i, I love that it's living on in this way it's great yeah it's great and that's all the community news this week and now some items from the wider tech world and first up in the headlines this week Stuart so the UK competition watchdog the competition and markets authority um have decided, they've announced today, that they're starting a probe into Apple and Google completely dominating mobile. Huh. 
They call it a market study rather than a probe. And they're looking into a whole bunch of things. They've drawn quite a wide remit here. They're looking at um, operating systems. They're looking at uh, mobile browsers. One of the big complaints a lot of people have had is that all browsers on iOS are actually shells around Safari. Um, but you've also got Chrome being bundled with Android. And if you don't bundle Chrome with Android, then you can't have any of the rest of the stuff and so on. So they're looking into a whole bunch of this. They want to, um, and they're not just looking at the impact on users, but also the impact on developers who are marketing products through Apple Store, Google Store. So this ties into things like the Epic versus Apple uh, case, which is going on, which I know you've talked about in the past and so on. I have a whole bunch of thoughts about this, but I'm interested in yours. What could they do about this? I mean, is this going to be like when they decided that that Tate and Lyle were the only sugar company, so they made up a new public one? Are they going to suddenly launch you know, UK government OS and start selling us phones to try and break a, this duopoly? I don't understand what they could do. I mean, I would not like to see a world in which the government of the country I live in, much as I dislike a lot of the stuff they do, I don't really want them to face off against a big American tech company and see who wins. <laughs> because they, <laughs> they they can say things like, well, you just can't sell your stuff here. Hmm. The risk is then Google call their bluff. Yeah. But also, like, what they say to both of them, you can't sell your stuff here. And then, then what happens? We either don't get any phones or we... Well, we expect other people who you know, have been trying to break into other markets suddenly say, "Ah, we can sell stuff in the UK and nowhere else now." I don't, I don't really understand what the what the best outcome is. Well, there are alternatives. We could go and get Sailfish phones, and we could get right. Xiaomi phones, and Huawei um, phones, those, and uh, yeah, Huawei phones, and the and that and that tablet that we talked about like ten minutes ago. Yeah, and the Nokia, the Nokia thing, whatever. Um, Asha, the operating system on. We could all go back to dumb phones. Maybe that would be a good thing. Oh, it's not a totally unreasonable point to be honest with you. I, 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 I think um, part of it is. There's a big call for some sort of regulatory thing to do something about this situation. But if you look at people like Heather Burns, who now works for um, the Open Rights Group, kind of a UK equivalent of the EFF, she's spoken up long and loud about how regulating big tech and importantly blaming all the problems on half a dozen big tech companies means that you end up stifling a whole bunch of smaller people too. And we're not very good at tech regulation. <laughs> the ICO are not great at this mm. stuff. So do you want them to do it? But equally, just going, well, just let a bunch of American companies decide what we're allowed to see also doesn't seem great either. So what's the answer? I'm kind of surprised this is a UK thing and not a European Union thing. European Union Commission, seem, they seem like the people who would do this. They have also started talking about things like this. Mm. Uh, I mean, if you, um, the first salvo in this was the GDPR, which the EU did, you know, four years ago or whatever. Um, so there's an increasing appetite for it, but yeah, don't know what's going to happen. Martin, what's next? Tim Berners Lee is going to auction the source code from early versions of the um, web as an NFT. Right. So this means that no one else will own or be able to run early versions of web servers or browsers because only one person will own them forever. That's right, isn't it? No. 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 <laughs> NFTs. Is that not how are... this works? Have I no, misunderstood? I, know, I, I think maybe I wrongly have the position of the crypto apologist on the podcast, and I'm really not. But on this uh, topic of NFTs, I'm with Alan that the, this is fair and squarely crypto nonsense. So an NFT is basically a unique form of digital ownership, but you don't necessarily get copyright control with this digital asset that you own. So this is a sale that's being handed by um, Sotheby's. And the way that they're advertising this is as a collection, and they've labeled it as the only signed copy of the code for the first web browser in existence, much like you might um, have a signed copy of a handwritten journal um, from some you know, famous figure. I hate this. It brings legitimacy to this nonsense, this absolute mm -hmm. nonsense. I saw a great tweet earlier where someone was describing what an NFT is, and it's effectively, you know, someone walking into the Louvre and asking to own uh, Mona Lisa, and someone 
coming out of a little side room and saying, "Yeah, you can, you can, you can buy the uh, the rights to this as an NFT," and then they write down on a little paper, piece of paper, that Mona Lisa is owned by Alan, and then they hide it in a little uh, filing cabinet in the back room behind a sign that says, "Beware of the leopard." And you don't actually own the thing; you can't walk away with the thing, the tangible asset, especially for digital goods where they're easily. Co- it's just nonsense. And what annoys me more is that he's giving the money to charity, which equally legitimizes this thing. Like, I don't, like, mind the fact that that charity is going to get some money. That's good, obviously. But the fact that they're using that to legitimize this just makes me cross, and I hate it. Mm-hmm. It's like, so Uncle Tim, don't do this to us. Don't mm-hmm. betray <laughs> us like this. It's the And his big thing recently has been um, pushing on uh, people getting fast broadband available to them. Now, 48% of children have um, slow or no broadband available to them, and we want to fix that. And that might be... He hasn't said where the money's going to go, but it might be to something like that. But, yeah, no. I mean, that shouldn't be funded by charity, and it certainly shouldn't be funded by crypto nonsense charity. And, and Sotheby's, uh, having a big name like Sotheby's, mm-hmm. legitimises this thing. Yeah, I just hate it, and I really, I, I thought we were seeing the end of this rubbish, but unfortunately, this has just <laughs> raked it all up again. I was going to say NFTs were dropping off in, you know, trend value, and this has <laughs> along with every other coin. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Alan, what's next? Google is using AI to rapidly design computer chips. Um, I find this fascinating. Uh, it's worth reading the story, but I find it um, the the, fu- the potential future of this fascinating. There's a YouTube channel I've recently um, been subscribed to, which is Tech Tech Potato. And it's a guy who knows an awful lot about chip design, manufacture, and he goes over it on his channel and talks a lot about um, the fundamentals of how chips are made and why they are the way they are and the shape they are and uh, the yields you can get from a slice of silicon and how many chips you can get and all that kind of stuff. And the, the, the thing about making chips is it's actually quite hard. You know, it's actually quite difficult designing new chips and manufacturing them and using AI in order to lay the stuff out in order to optimally get the, the best yield and the best layout uh seems like a you know a good idea because it, a lot of it isn't uh, it's not it's not really art it's getting the most practical layout of transistors on a like a tiny piece of silicon well, not tiny these days they're actually quite sizable but the thing that gets me is the fact that these are computer programs designing the future computers that further AI algorithms will run on, which could potentially design the next computer. And it's it like just like out of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where, you know, the most powerful computer in the world comes up with the meaning of life and designs a new computer that finds out what the question to that answer is. It, it's fa- I, I think it's fascinating. It's, um, you know, life imitating art. We're a couple of steps away from the hard takeoff of the singularity just yet, but yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like the, the history might look back at this as the misstep where we taught our robot overlords <laughs> the secret of procreation. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. The, the, the thing which I find immensely disappointing about stuff like this is there's a whole bunch of things like laying thing uh, about laying things out. So whether it's laying out stuff on uh, uh, silicon wafers or deciding the best way to balance out a graph or whatever, where the best mathematical techniques we've come up with are simulations of things which happen in nature so you do simulated annealing which is what uh, which is how they lay out um uh, silicon wafer stuff right now or you do force directed stuff where you just pretend that everything's joined up with springs <laughs> and then you just throw it in the air and run a physics simulation to see which position everything takes given that everything's joined to everything else by a spring and you're like what that's rubbish is that the best we can do <laughs> and the answer is yeah yeah it is until you have the ai stuff and last up in the news this week the fbi have revealed details of their trojan shield operation uh, so this was a collaboration with uh, various um, law enforcement agencies across the world, and apparently it was con- concocted over beers between the FBI and Australian police in 2018. So this was a scheme where they um, they co-opted a new 
secure messaging service called Anom, which was being developed by a guy who was facing prison, and they offered him some money and a lighter prison sentence to let them commandeer the app. And then they released this apparently secure messaging app on hardened secure devices uh, on the black market for criminals to buy. But as well as sending their messages to each other, it also sent them to the FBI. I love the fact that there were criminals out there yes, so. looking for the most hardened secure devices and, you know, feeling that they've they've got it, which made them very open about what they said on this device yeah. uh, to their, you know, collaborators. And the messages were just bouncing off of another server and being sent straight to the FBI where they can build up these giant array of data about these things, people who were very definitely criminals. This is not them pulling yeah. information from ev- all citizens as has been, you know, shown in the past by, um, Edward Snowden. But this is very targeted, but it's the, the criminals themselves who are volunteering in to participate in this. It's brilliant. I absolutely love it. They paid for the privilege. Yes. You know, they went to <laughs> FBI.com to buy their new phone. <laughs> I like this as well for the point that you make that, uh, you know, this proves that you don't need to backdoor every communications platform that's used by regular consumers that you can do these targeted stings and actually go after the criminals on the platforms that they're using rather than just you know usurp everything they did some nice pr with uh photos of once they once they arrested these hundreds of people all around the world in sting operations because they knew exactly where they were and where where the drops were going to be because the people would tell them uh directly on on the devices and they've got loads of pr shots of you know law enforcement people standing next to giant piles of cocaine and law enforcement people with balaclavas on standing next to giant piles of money and all that kind of stuff I'd love to think that the GPS was on and they actually knew precisely where these people were as well. Yeah, it's brilliant. I would absolutely think that's what they did. I mean, um, so since everyone's applauding this, I feel I should take one second to stand up for criminals. Um, <laughs> maybe not. But yeah, I grant you this sort of thing is good because it's a better alternative than we're just going to require that all... Um, cryptography is backdoored i can't call it crypto anymore because of all the nonsense i have to call it cryptography um so we don't we don't want them to backdoor all cryptography fine but i'm not at all sure i like the idea that now it's not just theoretical that maybe this thing you're getting has been backdoored which a whole bunch of cypherpunk people would tell you you need to be worried about that but no one really was it's like surely but now yeah this definitely happened now this is like the first person who steals things from the village where they all leave their front doors open. Maybe they needed to learn to lock their front doors, but it's a sad day when that happens. And that's all the news for this week. And that's all for episode 15. Thanks very much for listening. Join us next week when we'll be discussing the One Button Challenge from Foss Talk Live 2021. In the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email show at ubuntupodcast.org and you can come chat with us live in your area at ubuntupodcast.org slash telegram. (laughs) 